work. Did you ever fish without any bait? Of course you did. Every fisherman knows there's nothing about a bare hook to attract the fish. On the hook there must be some kind of bait. An artificial fly, a worm, a minnow, or a frog to attract the fish and cause him to strike. Without this bait, you'd come home at the end of the day disappointed. When you're searching for work, you're fishing for a job. What you catch will be determined largely by the bait you offer. Your personality, training, and experience are your bait. If you have to catch little or nothing in the way of a job. The fisherman uses special baits for the game fish. To get the better jobs, you must also use special baits in the form of special qualifications. Fewer game fish are caught than common fish. There are fewer game jobs to be caught. The fisherman has the ambition to catch the game fish. In the same way, every person has the ambition someday to land the big job. There is beginner's luck in fishing and beginner's luck in landing jobs, but you can't count on luck. Getting a job depends on you and your training. In choosing your life work, there are many things to be considered. First of all, you must know yourself, your strong points, your weaknesses, your likes and dislikes. Let us consider first your own native abilities. Tests have been developed which help you to measure your abilities. Our particular value are those called aptitude tests, which help you measure your abilities in special fields. Mechanical aptitude tests are a sample of this type. These cannot tell you exactly the occupation to choose, but they give you an idea of the type of work you can do best. They also help to guide you away from some fields in which you won't be successful. Each person has the ability to do just so much work, which is called his level of capacity. If he tries to do more than he is really able, he will be unhappy in his work. He will also be dissatisfied if he knows he could handle a better job than the one he has. There are tests which will help you choose work which fits your level of capacity best. How simple it would be to choose your life work if taking tests were the only thing you had to do in analyzing yourself. But they are only the first step. Another step in analyzing yourself is the examination of your own educational record. Your grades in different subjects back as far as it can be traced. If you've forgotten this, your teachers will be glad to assist you in looking it up. What does your educational record show? Have your grades been about the same all along the line? Or do they look like this, up and down like the crest and trough of an ocean wave? In what subjects have your grades been up? In what subjects have they been down? Why have they been up or down? Are you especially interested in certain subjects? If you don't like mathematics and your grades are low in this subject, you probably won't be very successful in those fields based on mathematics. Why are you interested in some subjects and not in others? You must answer these questions if you really wish to get acquainted with yourself. When you get a job, you will be judged in comparison with other workers, just as in school your work is graded in comparison with that of your classmates. All workers in any group are so judged. One will be considered the best in the group, another the poorest, with the rest arranged in between. This way may seem like a heartless process, but it is going on every day. The person who is ranked first today may not be first tomorrow unless he keeps on his toes and is alert to the changes which are constantly taking place in every line of work. Therefore, you should know what your rank in your class is in order that you may strive to raise or maintain it. Do you belong in the upper one-fourth, upper one-half? We hope you are not near the bottom. Another very important question you must ask yourself concerns your character. You will probably agree that honesty and loyalty are two of the strongest points of character. Are you honest with yourself? Are you honest with others? Are you loyal? The next point concerns your interests and accomplishments. In what are you especially interested? 
What can you do well? Do you like to work with ideas? Or would you rather work with things? List the things you like and that you do well and study them for a possible life work. We all realize that interests change frequently, but if the interest is strong and is based upon some real ability or accomplishment, it will grow. In fact, the more skilled you become, the faster your interest will grow, and so it may help you in picking your life work. Your social assets are very valuable in helping you to know yourself. Do you get along well with the gang, or do you have frequent fallouts? Do you prefer going with the crowd? Or would you rather spend the day alone, doing something you like to do? Do you do your best work when working with other people or when working alone? This is important in determining your future work. For one who likes to be alone would be unhappy in a job which required him to work as a member of a group and to be dependent upon others. The research worker is generally of the type who prefers to work alone. The successful salesman is largely dependent upon his ability to make a pleasing impression upon those with whom he comes in contact. Determination to succeed is an important factor in success. When things go wrong, do you say, I can't? If your grades fall below your expectations, do you say, what's the use? Every subject in the school has its part in rounding out your education. Do you say, I don't see any sense in studying something I'll never use? How do you know you'll never use it? When the road ahead of you is not entirely clear, do you continue to do your best? There is no place in success for a quitter. Are you a quitter? Your financial assets must receive consideration in choosing your life work. Does your choice require long and expensive training? Will you have the money? Will you need considerable money for equipment when you have completed your training and are ready to start work? Will you be able to finance yourself until you have an income from your own work? Many people train themselves for jobs and then are forced to do something else for lack of finances to get started. Every person should have one or more hobbies which he can do well and from which he derives pleasure and satisfaction. A hobby helps you relax after a hard day's work. It may also provide a job to fall back upon in case something happens to your regular means of earning a living. Many people today are working at things which were their hobbies a few years ago. May we ask, what is your hobby? What do you expect to get out of your life work? Many would answer money. Money is important for the things that it will buy, and a certain amount of it is therefore necessary. As important as money, however, as a return for your work, is the satisfaction that comes from doing an interesting job as well as or better than others are doing it. If you set such satisfaction as your goal, you may reasonably expect the financial part to take care of itself. Considerable time has been given to the problem of knowing yourself. It is the most difficult problem facing you, but it must be faced. Now, let's turn to some of the questions involved in studying occupations. It is well to get clearly in mind that each one of you can do several things successfully. No individual is limited to one occupation alone. You are at the point where the road has many branches. Any one of the several branches will get you to your destination, but many of them would lead you away from your goal. How can you find the right roads? If you wish to get the most out of your study of the occupations, you must follow some definite plan. First, you should get a broad view of as many occupations as possible. One way you can do this is by reading. There are many books and magazines which give quite clear word pictures of various fields of work, but this is not enough. You should talk to successful people in many lines, asking them questions about their work, the training required, where to get it, and the rewards of their occupations. Your school again will be glad to assist by arranging such conferences for you. There are many movies dealing with occupations, and from time to time you're going to see some of these. They will acquaint you with many types of work in various parts of the country. In making your investigation, do not limit yourself to your own locality, but make your survey as broad as possible. When you have completed a broad survey, choose those occupations that interest you for further study. Investigate the unpleasant side of the work as well as the pleasant for every type of work has its disagreeable side. No occupation has ever satisfied the worker all the time, 
But the pleasant thing should greatly outweigh the unpleasant if you are seriously considering that particular occupation. This step will cause you to cross some off your list because you feel that the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. Make an intensive study of the remaining interesting occupations. You will now want to ask some questions concerning them. What does the worker do? Is the occupation overcrowded? What are the starting points and lines of promotion? What are the future prospects for earnings and advancement? What general and special education is required? Where can it be secured? What will this education cost? What will it cost to get established in this occupation? What are the physical requirements? Is it apt to be detrimental to my health? Would I be happy in this work? Many more questions will occur to you as you study the occupations. And remember, you cannot know too much about the work into which you decide to go. While in school, you have all about you many opportunities to improve yourself. Are you making the most of them? The modern school consists of many departments, each contributing its part to make possible a broad educational background that will be valuable in your adult life. The English department offers courses which will help you to speak and write correctly. Courses in literature acquaint you with the world's literary masterpieces, so you can discover for yourself the pleasure to be found in reading them. The social science group provides a chance to study the past, so that you can better understand the conditions of today. Everyone should know more about his government in order that he may be a more useful citizen. Modern developments in transportation and communication have brought cities, states, and nations of the world so close together that we are all subject to the same influences. And no matter what we do for a living, we have many new problems in human relationships which must be solved. A study of the social sciences helps us understand these problems. Mathematics gives you training in arithmetic and shows you how to use it in problems which come up constantly in your everyday life. You must have higher mathematics to succeed in some occupations. In the study of mathematics, you develop your ability for systematic, logical, and accurate reasoning. The sciences, natural and physical, have an influence on the production of everything you eat, wear, or use. For this reason, the sciences play a very direct part in your life and you should learn to understand and appreciate them. Physical training aims at a healthy body through exercise and planned recreation. If you lose your health, it is difficult and expensive to regain it. The progress of the human race can be traced through its development in music and art. Only a few people can become skilled musicians and artists, but all can learn to appreciate the great works of music and art. Most of you can develop enough ability in these fields to get real enjoyment out of them. School libraries are rapidly being developed along lines similar to our public libraries. In them, the latest books in many fields will be found, and the individual is free to read according to his interests. The commercial department offers courses in accounting, shorthand, and typing that develop skills through which you may get a job in the commercial world. But even if you never do commercial work, you should understand fundamental business principles and be able to apply them in your everyday life. The homemaking department, through its courses in cooking, child care, and home management, trains girls to be good housewives. Courses in sewing are also valuable, whether a girl expects to keep house or enter the business world. The development of good buying judgment is of highest importance, for according to economists, women do at least 75% of the nation's buying. The Industrial Arts Department will help you in four main ways. First, to learn about industrial design, materials, processes, and products. 
so that you will know more about manufacturing and industry and their effect upon your own life. Second, to learn how to buy and use industrial products more intelligently. Third, to help you learn the fundamental tool processes. If you never use this skill in an actual job, it will always come in handy and may be fun for you as a hobby. And fourth, you have a chance to try out your ability in a number of kinds of industrial work which may guide you in the choice of one for making your living. Some schools have agriculture departments which cover the latest developments in farm crops, animal husbandry, farm management and other important matters which are of value to the owner or operator of a farm. Now comes another very important part of the discussion of your life work. What is education? Education starts very early and continues throughout life, from birth to death. Education is the total of all your experiences, both real and imaginary, in school and outside of school. In fact, life itself is education. Many adults go to night school to acquire additional training to improve themselves. For the more experience or education you have in regard to any problem, the greater your chance of solving the problem correctly. We all know that coordination of the mind and body is necessary in most of the games we play. It is just as necessary in most jobs. To do your life work successfully, you must at all times have perfect coordination. The importance of coordination is shown in a study of the type of work done in over 4,000 occupations listed by the Census Bureau. Suppose that these hundred figures stand for all the workers in those 4,000 occupations, or most of the workers in the country. Out of every hundred, only 13 workers have jobs based entirely on mental skills, or which require them to work with their minds alone. Only 18 out of every hundred have jobs based on manual skills, in which they work mainly with their hands. All these that are left, or 69 out of every hundred, do work requiring that the hand and mind be trained together for perfect coordination. You will probably be one of the 69, for perfect coordination is necessary for the dentist, the typist, the industrial worker, the homemaker, in fact, for almost everyone. Just as a building must be built on a carefully planned foundation, so must your life be built on careful plans. Let us see if we can plan the foundation of a successful career for you. As the first block of your foundation, you must have health. Without health, no one can be entirely successful. The second block is character. Develop your character. Your general education is the third block of your foundation. Keep your educational record clear. The fourth block is citizenship. Are you a good citizen? Next comes your special interests and abilities. Are you finding and developing them? Ambition is the spark plug of the human engine, the force that makes things happen. Do you need a new spark plug? You may have special abilities and ambition, but are you willing to work hard to succeed? There is no shortcut to success. You should know yourself better than anyone else knows you. Get acquainted with yourself. The bigger the job, the more training required. Are you planning to get that training? On top of this base, you can place the stone of success, confident that your foundation is well laid. Examine your foundations, and never for one moment believe anyone who may try to tell you that you can't achieve success in this country today. It's true that competition is keen. The standards by which you will be measured are high. Opportunity isn't likely to knock at your door. You'll have to go out and hunt it for yourself. But the opportunity is there if you're prepared to take advantage of it. There are thousands of occupations awaiting the workers who are qualified to fill them. There are jobs in journalism. Monster presses turn out thousands of newspapers every day. A reporter today has to work hard to get the news. He has to be able to write so people will read his copy. But so did reporters 50 years ago. There are jobs in livestock farming and dairy farming. The farmer works long hours, but so have farmers for centuries past. There are jobs in new lines of work, radio and television, for example. 
you'll probably never get to be a millionaire in this field, but millionaires have always been few in number. Somewhere in this great land, there is a chance for you to make a living and lead a happy life. Americans have always made their own opportunities. It's up to you to make yours. Hello everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime streaming show. Uh, that last film was Finding Your Life's Work, uh, which is part of a series I've been showing the little segment ones, the specific ones, like for the baking industry, for electricians, pharmacy, etc. Uh, I have several of these, and uh, I've been showing them over the last couple of months, and this is the kind of the intro uh, and this would be something that would be shown uh, maybe at a trade school, maybe shown in high school, maybe shown in junior college, community college, uh, or if somebody was uh, in some sort of special program to figure out what they would do with their lives. Uh, this is 1940s, so World War II was still going on, and um, so uh, many young men weren't available. Uh, they were basically uh, fighting. Uh, so this is kind of interesting uh, to see these these things about occupations when we had a major war going on. Um, so that was kind of interesting. All right, so uh, next we're going to watch a film about busy airports. Uh, and hopefully this uh, week we won't have many busy airports. We'll have people staying where they are. Um, celebrating the holidays remotely. Airport in a big city is a very busy place. So many things happening. So see, there's a huge parking lot. Thousands of people come to the airport every day. This is David's first visit to a big airport. His father promised that he would take him to the airport on his birthday. David is wondering where all the people are going. Perhaps these people are going to meet someone arriving from another city or another country. Perhaps this man is going on vacation. Passengers like this man, as well as visitors, usually go first to this big building, the terminal building. In the terminal building, there are restaurants where travelers may eat and relax, and shops where many things can be bought. Here's one of the most important places in the terminal building, a ticket counter. Passengers report here before they board their planes. This is called checking in. David sees many ticket counters. He never realized there were so many different airlines. Some airlines fly planes to large cities in the United States. Some fly to cities overseas. Someday, David would like to take a trip to a distant land. You can go almost anywhere in the world by air in a matter of hours. David's father explains that when a passenger takes a plane trip, there are certain things he must do, such as weighing in his baggage and getting his ticket checked. When this has been done, the passenger waits until his plane is ready to leave. To see some planes, David and his father are going out to the observation deck on the top floor of the terminal building. From the high observation deck, David and his father can see far across the field to the hangars.
In the huge hangars, planes are kept when they're not being flown. There's a jet plane coming in for a landing. And here's another plane that has already landed. Many of these passengers are men who have come to this city on business. Here is a smaller plane that carries passengers and freight. About two hours ago, a plane like this one was being checked at a smaller airport. This airport is about 200 miles away from the large airport where David is. This airport is often used by small planes, which carry only a few passengers. This man is taking something to the terminal building to send by air freight. See what it is? A small dog. At the baggage counter, the dog is put into a special shipping crate. The dog seems quite comfortable. Where is he going to be shipped? All kinds of freight can be transported to almost any place in the world by air, from one airport to another. Now let's go back to the airport where David and his father are spending their afternoon. There's something David has been hoping to see, a helicopter. It's coming in for a landing. This helicopter is large enough to carry quite a few passengers. Helicopters are often used for short trips to take people back and forth from the city to the airport. But longer trips between cities are usually made in big jet planes. This is the largest plane David has ever seen. Many mechanics doing many different jobs are needed to help keep a big plane in good running order. This mechanic is checking the outside of one of the big jet engines. Every so often, the big engines are taken apart and thoroughly inspected. Fueling the big planes is another job that men at the airport do. Some men load baggage and freight. For easier handling, the baggage is placed in this large container called a pod. A kind of elevator lifts the pod to the baggage compartment in the plane. Sacks of mail to distant cities are loaded in another way, on a moving belt. Besides mail and freight, food is loaded from a special kind of truck. The body of the truck is raised up to the plane. The food being loaded comes from the airport kitchen. Here, busy cooks prepare thousands of meals every day. International Jet Flight 33 Non-stop to San Francisco, departing gate K3. All aboard, please. A kind of bridge has been pushed out to the plane. This is called a loading tube. Through this tube, passengers can walk from the terminal building into the plane. After the plane is loaded, the pilot is ready for takeoff. First, he must ask the airport control tower what runway to use. He must also get other instructions. These instructions come by radio from the control tower, which overlooks the entire airport. In the tower, men control the air traffic at the airport. International 2, taxi to runway 25. All when ready to take off. Far down the runway, the big jet is taking off. When this plane reaches a speed of about 200 miles an hour, it is going fast enough to rise into the air. It can fly over 600 miles an hour. As the jet takes off, David and his father see a smaller plane coming in to land. It's the same plane we saw before at the smaller airport. David's father seems very interested in this plane. 
Would David like to see some of the freight this plane has carried? Yes, he would. In the freight room, David sees many kinds of freight. These cartons contain live tropical fish from Florida. Drugs and medicines are shipped by plane because they are often needed quickly. There's the dog we saw at the smaller airport. Now, David's father tells the agent his name, William Martin. Is there a shipment for him? The agent checks his list. Yes, there is a shipment for William Martin. What kind of shipment is David's father getting? Is this dog for him? No, it's for David. It's a birthday present for him. David never thought when he came to the airport that a dog would come by air for him. Perhaps someday you may get a present at an airport, as David did. Remember, we depend on our airports for many things. Airports handle much of the mail we get, letters and parcels sent by airmail. Airports handle many of the things we need every day, which are shipped by air freight. And airports are centers of transportation, places where people come and go by air travel. Someday you may go to see the many exciting things that David saw in his visit to the busy airport. Um, I love looking at uh, films from earlier times uh, that show infrastructures and show things like how we traveled, like the train station and passenger trains and how buses operated. And certainly airports are, you know, this amazing um, kind of bringing together of different of people and businesses and industry and government to kind of create these spaces where people are going from point A to point B and all the hurdles and things that are thrown in our way because of security and because there's airports always under construction or because there's too many uh, planes in the air or, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting to kind of see. Uh, it's one of the things I love when I fly is I love watching that infrastructure and just sitting and, and watching that. Um, it's frustrating when I get caught up in it um, and certainly have had horror stories of not easily getting from point A to point B, um, starting in Los Angeles, ending up in North in Raleigh, North Carolina, but via a bus, via two buses, uh, one bus that uh, broke down, uh, had flat tire, and then it had to be rescued from with another bus that drove us finally from Richmond Airport to Raleigh Airport, um, where I ended up being roughly, I think, five hours late. Ugh. Anyways, um, this uh, I had talked about the really awesome series, the Let's Go series, um, that Encyclopedia Britannica came out with in the late 60s, early 70s, where things just kind of go a little crazy. Um, and this is an example of that. This is Join Hands.
So you can see influences of uh, Sesame Street in there, these short little vignettes um, that are provocative um, in that they get kids talking. And that's the point of this series is you show it to ki a bunch of kids in your language arts class, and then you get them to talk about it afterwards, and you get them to think about what they saw and maybe write a story, draw a picture, or together they come up with a group story. So it's, it's supposed to get kids' brains firing, which is why you see all these adults doing foolish things. Kids love that. <clears throat> love it. Um, I should say uh, thank you so much to Mark and William for coffee. Um, coffee is much needed. I got started a little late this morning or today because I was busy looking at a um, software interface and got my brain forgot what time it was. Uh, so I fell down a little hole uh, there. Um, so this next film... Oh, and I should say that this is the 250th episode of the Lunchtime Show. Uh, we've been doing this since mid-March, and uh, I want to thank all of you who've been along for the ride. Uh, it's been really wonderful, in spite of all the badness going on outside. It's been really great to sit and share these films with you, and has kind of reinvigorated me and looking at my collection and pulling films from my collection and showing them to you because you guys are a great audience and I love the time that we spend together. So thank you so much. This, I don't know how far I would have gotten if it wasn't for the fact that you guys have been tuning in. Uh, and I should say the coffee helps. <laughs> but that's not why we do it. We do it because we collect these films and we want to share them. Um, they're culturally significant and also some of them are just hilarious. All right, so uh, this next film is uh, more of an arty film. Um, my The uh, title is Cut Off. It came out in 1949. It's by Philip Staff, and it's called A Picture in Your Mind, and um, has a really great score, and uh, it's it's not silly. It's it's actually uh, pretty good. And my, my copy is a little beat up, but I'm happy that I have it. So here we go, Picture in Your Mind. Civilization. Or are these the shadows of dusk before the last long night? The dying embers, the silent end. future is up to you. Who? Oh. Me? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. You and me. And everyone. Everywhere. Because the sum of all our thoughts and actions will decide which future. And see, among all the people who give life and movement to our globe, there are a hundred ways of life for which men have died. The time is here to ask instead, how can we live? How can we live together on our congested earth? There is no easy answer. There's no easy way. 
But in our search, we can turn back in time to our common origin, to the spark of life in the primeval waters. design of nerves and sinews, alert, aware, more sensitive than the beasts, whose garden was the whole earth, a simple shelter, the good fruits, the wide horizon. was another side of the garden, danger, loneliness, and the advancing terror of cold. From hunger and loneliness, men banded together. From need, men kindled fire. But when the nourishing fields withered, the tribes scattered over the face of the earth. in one swift current until finally some group paused in some corner of the earth to live and work together in natural isolation to spin a pattern of life set over the rhythm of nature rights for birth rights for death and rights for the turn of the seasons a rhythm for work rhythm for prayer, and a pattern for beauty and courage, a shape for the shelter, a shape for the temple, and a form for the image of God. So, as the deep current of time flowed through the awakening mind, a picture was formed. Our way is the natural way, as natural as sunlight, as natural as day. But within these groups there were other forces, other tensions seeking an outlet, jealousy, anger, guilt. And there was the other tribe across the river across the hilltop. Across the sea. Who had different colored skins. Ate forbidden food. Worshipped other gods, distant, strange. Heard only through the distorted ear of rumor. The other tribe kills the aged. The other tribe has green skins. They have a strange smell. 
Give them a house and it'll soon be a hovel. No amount of education will ever help them. Our fields are empty this season. And who's to blame? Throw the god in the river. Who's to blame? The tribe across the river. The people across the railroad tracks. We have many hungry and sick this year. Whose fault is that? The people across the river. They are to blame. They have strange ways. Their ways are unnatural. They are bad. We are natural. They are wrong. We are right. We are right. We are right. We are right. Our way is the right way. Here we are today, a long way from Eden. The tribes have multiplied constantly until the whole earth is crowded with many different ways of life, overlapping. And the world is brought to our doorstep. The news is hurried to the brain, trouble, strife, hunger, health. Murder. Well, what can I do about the world? Am I my brother's keeper? I'm only one man and my actions won't count. Wait. You're not alone. There are people like yourself everywhere, united in a common need to learn to live together in a shrinking world. For in the span of each separate life, everyone grows from a single cell. Sleeps in the dark water. Remembering the primeval past. And emerges finally to breathe the air of history. Our need to live together, our civilization, our education, have bare memory the ancient primal impulses. But they are not dead. Unexposed, uncontrolled, they will control us. These are the hidden roots of prejudice. In time of need, they can be turned against us. Listen. Hungry? Whose fault is it? The man with the other way of life. Cold? Homeless? Whose fault is that? The man who has your job, the other man. Afraid? Angry? Want to blame someone else? Blame the man with the other way of life. Blame anyone who's different. Blame, 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 blame. And so you are tied, hand and foot, heart and mind. Well, what can I do? What can I think? Look into your own mind. What picture of the other man do you find drawn there? Do you see the other man as you imagine him? Or as he really is? Do you look for the real man behind the distortion of propagandists? Are you always right? The other man always wrong? 
Or are the roles interchangeable? How about your own hidden impulses? Do you project them onto the other man, the other race? No man is all bad or all good. Look into yourself. Do you think yourself superior? Perhaps because of the way you dress. Or because of your own familiar music. And all our differences, what shall we make of them today and in the future? Shall one way of life be imposed on everyone until we become automatons, a world of robot minds? Or shall we accept our differences and enrich all our lives with the fruits and the knowledge of many histories? Many patterns. Many songs. And many dances. The world is a good place to live in. The right to live in it is every man. From need, the tribe was born. From necessity, the peoples of our shrinking world must become one people. United across all our differences. The current of time is flowing swiftly into the future. And there are always those hungry for the reins of tyranny who would use our prejudices to mislead us. Between us and a united world lies the danger of war, which could destroy not only man, but the earth itself. No! What you think, what you do, is important. For the sum of all our thoughts and actions will decide which future. Darkness? <laughs> Every once in a while, I gotta show something a little heady. Um, visually, it's stunning, really, really stunning. In 1949, this is post World War II, and it's really trying to say, like, really dr try to address the prejudices that were taking place and that were obvious um, during that time, and also really kind of looking at how the prejudices uh, were manifesting themselves in other. Uh, countries and you know what led to Nazi Germany what led to um, you know, the rise of these fascist uh, dictatorships in these other countries in Japan and in you know Italy and, and all these places and so this is trying to address that and look at it um, in a visually really fascinating way I'd love to find a, a Kodachrome or a Technicolor print of this film it would because it's just visually so great um, and little snippets of, of the scenes are really quite something. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, thank you, Elias, for the coffee. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, as always, really enjoy spending our time together. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow. Um, and we'll be doing live shows until Friday, which is Christmas Day. And Christmas Day, we are going to have, um, we'll be broadcasting live. But the, the show will actually be curated by uh, uh, AV Geeks Blender. And I'll tell you more about that when we get there. Um, but it's uh, it will be a christmas theme show, but it will be super mixed up and random and lots of little tiny clips. 
that are related to Christmas. And I'll talk more about that as we get closer to the day and I figure more of it out. But um, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. You can hit like, subscribe. You can share. Uh, all those things you can do. Of course, coffee is great. And avgeeks.com is a place you can look and see other things that we have online that we've been digitizing, including a bunch of stuff we haven't even shown on here yet. We did a, a lot of work for Perlanger Archives, so that's up there. We digitized over 600 NASA film and videos that we haven't even really shown um, that are also up there. Uh, and plus, I, I tend to show stuff that's a little bit shorter on this uh, streaming show, and there's a lot of longer pieces that are online uh, there. So that's a wonderful place to go and see what we got going on. Uh, also on the YouTube channel, there's a bunch of stuff there. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow. Everybody have a good rest of your day. And um, as always, please rewind and love each other. And um, smiley face with uh, eyelashes. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.